Hello and welcome to a very special edition of the Keep Right On podcast. I'm Alex Dickin and as ever I'm joined by my co-host and colleague Brian Dick. And today we are joined by Birmingham City women's manager Darren Carter. Darren, thanks very much for coming on. How's things going? Yeah, all good. Thank you and uh, thank you for having me on. Um, I know this is a, it's a platform that a lot of Blues fans uh, come to. So yeah, um, honoured that you've uh, invited me on. Um no, yeah, we've obviously on international break this weekend, so um, we've not had a game, and it's been quite nice to to have a little bit of a, a reset moment. Um, we've obviously a, a big seven games for us now coming up to to finish the season, so going into to clutch time. Um, so yeah, gearing up for for the final running. We, we might as well get straight into it. Um, how has that international break been, and what has been going on at the training ground with the women's side of things? Yeah, the. It seems, and I've said this a few times now, that it seems like there's a lot of international breaks within the women's game um, and it, it's very stop-start. So for me personally, it's um, double-edged sword, really. We've, we've, you know, very privileged to have a lot of internationals in our squad, which is great, obviously, for them and, and them going away and representing the countries. But it does then leave us with very few numbers for training. Um, so not massively, from a selfish point of view, not massively enamoured with the, the international breaks um, because, yeah, I lose a lot of the squad. Um, it obviously impacts them what you can actually do in terms of your prep for, for the next game leading off the, the back of the break. Um, and we only get them back in the building on Friday before we play Crystal Palace on the Sunday. So, um, so yeah, I'm not a massive fan of them um, and it's pretty quiet uh, around the place. But, yeah, it's it's a good chance to get some work into the ones that stay and some individual work as well. Um, but yeah, it's a lot quieter than than I like it. <clears throat> Darren, I guess the big fear when when players go away is that uh, that they all come back safely and 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 not injured. And, and obviously, you've had the misfortune of, of picking up a. I guess I, I'd describe it as a bad injury with, with, with Jamie. Um, uh, how 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 is um, how is Jamie Finn at the moment? And, and can you shed shed any light on 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 the prognosis? She's, yeah. oh, she's sorry. I, sorry, I should just say for everybody, she she suffered a, an ACL in training away with Ireland. Sorry, Darren. Yeah, go on, please, mate. Yeah, and and I think it's obviously been well documented now within the the women's game the the ACL injury and and how frequent they're happening. Uh, it's obviously happening at an alarming rate. We had uh, obviously Siobhan Wilson last year um, towards the back end of last season. Um, tear her ACL um, and MCL as well. She did the, the whole shebang. Um, and we're actually getting Siobhan now back. She's back out on pitch and back training with us, which is which is fantastic. But yeah, as that happens, as you say, Jamie then um, suffers her ACL injury in training with Ireland last week. So yeah, I've, I've briefly messaged Jamie because I know that it's such a, you know, um, a hard time for her now. I think just obviously letting it sink in and the impact now that that's going to have on her and knowing the the rehab process um, and while well, the immediate process will be uh, potentially surgery and um, and then we'll get her back into the rehab process. Um, so yeah, it, it's horrible because it's you know a nine month at least a nine month layer uh, layoff, um, and I think because of it, it's been happening so so much and been so well documented, I think there's a bit of a frustration out there at the moment that. Um, is enough being done to actually prevent this injury within the women's game. Um, so, yeah, I know there's there's a lot going on um, to try and figure this out. Um, but, yeah, in terms of, of Jamie's case, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm devastated for her, as is, is everybody, the players and staff. But we'll support her as as, um, as best as we can and, and obviously get her on the, the right track now to recovery. Um, and knowing Jamie and her mindset and, and the person she is, she'll... Um, yeah, she'll do everything she can to, to get herself back fit as, as quickly as possible. But yeah, devastated for her. When do you expect to, to see her next cards? So I think she's, yeah, she's been seen out in Dublin, um, in Ireland, and um, seeing a specialist and everything out there. And then she'll fly back out at, at some point this week uh, back to us. And, and obviously then, as I say, we'll start the process on um, potentially surgery and, and how that looks. Um, and then... Yeah, obviously we'll we'll map it out um, moving forward on on how that rehab process um, continues. 
Uh, she she had played in in your, your most recent game, hadn't she? Uh, that 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 loss at home to, home to St Andrews uh, at home at St Andrews, I suppose I should say at Nighthead Park as well, just to cover my cover my back. Um, what what what's your view of the of, of the run of run of results? I think it was th- three losses that, that that took you into this international break. How, how how do you reflect on those now? Yeah, I think all the three games. Obviously, we come out the the new year and and we'd won three on the bounce and and um, continued obviously our form going into to Christmas. And I think all three defeats have been very different. I think we we went to Watford um, and. Um, really took a sucker punch, really, um, dominating the game and, and kind of threw the game away um, towards the end. And, you know, so we were frustrated about that one um, because that's one that we allowed to to get away from us. Um, the Leicester game, I think, was coming up against a, a real quality team. Um, obviously, a WSL team have invested really well and, and brought in some excellent players. And again, just mistakes cost us at the moments in that game. And again, come away frustrated because I think there's... Um, certainly a, a period after half time at 3 2 where we were very much in the game and on the front foot and, and in control and um, looking for that equaliser. So, again, frustrated off the back of that. And Southampton at the weekend, you know, I thought was one of our best first halves in terms of dominating the game and some of the football we played. And again, should have probably been two or three up in the game and um, have gifted them a, a way back into it right on half time, which is never a good. Uh, time to concede and and then second half I think we yeah we kind of imploded on ourselves in terms of our um, we kind of got a little bit panicky and frantic you know once we went behind and again it was a an error from us um, yeah we never regained control so yeah it's been a, a couple of weeks where we've we've kind of allowed games to get away from us I wouldn't say um, the games that we've lost in terms of the the, the opposition being that much better than us I think it's you know we can certainly look at all three and say that you know we've we've gifted or given moments to the opposition that's um, allowed them to, to win the game so yeah it's a bit of a reset for us and and the international break as I say is, is always a chance to reflect um, you like to be going in reflecting on good form and, and, and off the back of a win but yeah, I suppose for us now uh, we did it early on, on in the season the start of the season obviously we didn't start well and it was an international break that then reset us and we, we, we kicked into motion. So I'm um, you know, confident that we can allow this one now to do exactly the same and we can go on another run. And obviously these last seven games, we, we give it all we got. Just to bring everyone up to speed, uh, that, that, that sequence of results have left, uh, left Darren and the team fifth in the Women's Championship. Um, Five points off, off top spot, um, but it's very, very tight. The, 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 the four teams above... Blues are currently separated by own, only only a point, and you have got a game in hand. So it, it very much is, is all to play for, and, and there's, there's going to be a lot of a uh, sort of throat slitting amongst the, uh, amongst those top five teams, isn't there? With lots of teams playing each other, and and, and as you say, Darren, you go into uh, into your next match against second place Crystal Palace this weekend. So yeah, there's still all to play for. Yeah, and I think kind of you know you look at where we were this time last year, and we were you know very much off the pace and 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 having to really chase down the the ones above us um and we ended up going within a point of obviously doing that in the end but so at least this year we've given ourselves a bit more um of a platform and there's less of a gap um but yeah i think it's kind of just getting over that frustration of of obviously putting ourselves in a strong position going into the new year and um even up until the, the watford game you know i think we we're in a position where with games in hand, we could have put ourselves top again. Um, so yeah, we've we've let it slip a little bit, but yeah, again, it's never never easy, and any season will always have its adversity and bumps in the road. And yeah, if you want to achieve anything, we know you have to you have to go and earn it. So that's um, certainly what we're going to have to do now for the last seven games. But yeah, I'm confident. You know, the group is strong. We've got some great experience, um, and it's just about us, yeah, regaining that control again now and. And finding our rhythm. I, I remember speaking to you this time last year, Darren, and you said that you'd have to be pretty much perfect to make a challenge and you ended up coming one point short of the uh, of top spot. Um, how do you view the final seven now? What do you think is going to be needed? I think it's just consistency and, and 
you know, we we obviously play uh, teams in and around us. Obviously, Palace is our next game. We, we've still got to go to Charlton. Um, but the league, as it is at the moment, is uh, very unpredictable. And and you know, the the championship. I know speaking to to coaches and managers before we dropped into it last year that it was getting stronger by the season. And you've seen it again this year. Um, the quality of opposition and quality and the investment that's going into teams now is meaning that it's becoming a lot more competitive. So I think you're going to see a lot more surprises in, in the last uh, latter part of the season. I don't think any game is a given at all. Um, so yeah, I think for us, it's pretty much what we did last year. Focus game to game, focus on on um, what we can do and we can control. And, and yeah, going and getting three points, uh, that's all we can, um, can control ourselves and see where that puts us. When, when we talk about investment, it must have, been, must have been music to your ears last year when, when Tom Wagner and United came in and said they'd be putting, you know, investment not only into the playing squad, but also the infrastructure on the women's side of the game. Yeah, and, it, and listen, I think it was very, very much needed, as we all knew across the whole football club. Um, everything was needed, you know, investment was needed and there was all sorts of um, areas that needed improving, uh, probably every area of the football club. <laughs> And for us, you know, personally, it was, um, you know, very, very much needed. I think when I came in, um, was it November 2021 now? It was um, that the this team, the women's team, was in the worst place it's ever been. And it certainly needed, um, you know, a, a rejig and a reset and, and needed taken care of um, because it had just been left um, to rot, really. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, a you know a, a slog at times to um, you know to keep things on track and try to improve things slowly. And as I say, when you know Nighthead have come in and and you know the plans they have in place um, to improve everything at the football club, but obviously us as a women's team, um, yeah, it's just a, a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's going to take time because I think there's there's so much that needs to be done. Um, across the whole football club, so it's not like it's coming in wave a magic wand and everything's perfect. Um, it's going to take you know a while to fix the years of neglect, basically, um, especially with the women's team. Darren, is it as simple as, as saying that you know you, that, that does it feel like you, you you are all one club again now, uh, whereas, whereas before you were. I don't know. I'll use the word ignored. You, 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 you may, you may disagree with that, but just, just talk, just talk us through that, that, that difference in perception of the way the women's team is 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 viewed by the ownership now. Yeah, I think the um, the the biggest thing I could probably say, Bry, is that there was it, when I first came back to the club, um, it just felt like there was just everyone was was their own entity. You know the men's first team, the men's academy, the women's team. You know, no one, and it was off the back of COVID. So again, I understand obviously with bubbles and everything else. And but yeah, it just didn't feel like a. a it didn't feel like the football club I knew. You know, growing up, supporting and being part of. And um, you know, I'd had a year. You know, during my career, obviously coming back with my injury and and just you know that was a Europa League year. Um, so yeah, it just didn't feel like Birmingham City. And I remember saying if I could, you know, just pick us up and, and take us to another site just on our own, I'd do that because it was, it just, you know, you just had a lot of people who were, were just super drained and and had just been, you know, completely overworked, under-resourced, uh, underfunded. So to, you know, to, to see the change now and to see where the football club is currently and is heading, is yeah worlds apart from from what I walked back into um, two years ago. So yeah, it, it's as I say, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I'm you know I'm pleased that there's there's people that have, have been through it all and are coming out now and seeing that because I think along the way we've lost a lot of good people at the, from from the football club just because you know they've they've had enough and they've you know um, not had that optimism and not seen that positivity or that light come in. So um, for those who have been through it all, you know, I'm pleased now that they're seeing the, the fruition of of owners who come in, who care and who genuinely want to change things for the better um, and are driven and, and, and have shown the plans, the communication, um, 
because yeah, it's I think for the first time in a very very long time, people can can see that someone actually cares about the football club and wants it to uh, to move into the right uh, right place. Alex, uh, no, I was going to say um, that I rarely get down to down to Wasp Hills. These I think I've been twice in the last six months. Um, because first team press conferences are normally at the uh, the Henley facility now, and I was just wondering whether you could kind of shed any light on what Wast Hills is like at the moment in terms of pitches and the development that's been made over the last six months. Yeah, there's there's um, processes in place, and, and we've been shown the plans now, and, and kind of how that's the stages that's going to happen. Um, so Wast Hills at the moment is very much a, a building site. Um, you know we're. Uh, as a staff, you know, women's staff and, and academy staff are, are in kind of porter cabins as offices, which, again, is fine because we've seen the plans that are, are in place. So you can, you know, you can take that for the, the interim. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of work going on. And this is, I think, that in terms of pitches, the obviously the the, the main pitch has had the investment now over the summer. And um, Dale and the, the groundsman, um, Dale Ketteridge and his team work incredibly hard across the two sides to to obviously keep this, the, the pitches in good condition and um, in best possible standard that they can. Um, and yeah, as I say, you, you you just feel like, yes, there's, there's still a transition happening and there's still a lot of work happening, but you know it's for the greater good and you know that the investment's there, um, the plans are in place and yeah, everything's being done now to to get it ready as quickly as possible but again we know it's it's not just going to happen overnight there's um you know there's things that are going to be ready at the end of this month there's things that are going to be ready at the end of april and then throughout the summer there's going to be more stuff completed um and by the end of it it's going to be a, a proper facility and a facility that is going to allow the academy the women's team um to to flourish would you i was i was I've had this conversation a lot this season about like obviously separate teams being at separate facilities. And I was just wondering from your perspective, would you like all the teams to be under one roof? Would that help or is it not really that relevant? I think ultimately against kind of what Brian touched on earlier, I think being together and, and being as one as a football club, um, it would, the ideal scenario would be having everybody under mm. one roof. And, and obviously that means then having a, a site or a complex that's, big enough to house everybody and, and not feel like everyone's on top of each other. Um, so yeah, I think ideal scenario would be that. Um, obviously, we know Wast Hills isn't a, a massive site. It has got capacity to, to be bigger than what it is at the moment. Um, so I think ideally, yeah, listen, as, as a football club, you want everyone under the same roof and um, all the staff together because it is, you know, we're Birmingham City and, you know, it's, it's one big family and I think you know, if you can help support and push each other, being on the same complex is always on day to day is, is going to be that perfect scenario. Um, as I say, with us at the moment, with, with how big Wast Hills is and obviously having now Epic, um, how that, you know, flows and, and goes on um, in the coming years will obviously be decided by the ownership. But um, yeah, it's, as I say, the atmosphere now, especially at Wast Hills, is. You know, far brighter and far better than than it than it has been um, previously. Darren, yeah, I, I, I'm glad I touched on this beforehand because there was a, was a little bit of trepidation as to uh, whenever you ask a footballer what their experiences is of a previous manager. Uh, I know you worked at Tony Mowbray. I saw that you you left when he was in charge at, at the Hawthorns, but uh, yeah, you just just. Uh, just give us uh, your your little potted history uh, of Tony, and, and you were obviously at West Brom together, weren't you? Yeah, so, so Tony came in, um, replaced Brian Robson at, at West Brom when I was there, and um, I think it was instant, really, that when Tony came in, we were midway through a season um, where we kind of you know started pretty averagely um, in the championship, and you were kind of floating in and around, I think eighth or seventh or eighth when, when Brian Robson left and, and Tony came in and, and made it quite clear from day one, his philosophy, how he wanted to play. And for me personally, as a midfield player who, who wanted to wanted the ball rather than it being a, a you know, a transitional game, uh, it was music to my ears. And again, just from a, a coaching perspective, you know, it was very much everything was with the ball. You know, there was very little kind of conditioning stuff. You got your conditioning with the ball. And um, 
just him as a person as well. He was he was the first manager really I'd had uh, to that point that had kind of you know cared about you as a or had asked questions about you as a person. You know, wanting to get to know you. Um, I think previous to you know I'd had Steve Bruce, Mick McCarthy, Brian Robson. You know, you kind of old school managers. Uh, Tony was very much you know a forward thinking coach, and you could see that. You know, he wanted to get the best out of you, but also wanted you to know that he cared about you, you know, not just as a footballer. So um, that was, again, new, I think, to, to a lot of us. Um, and now you see, obviously, how the game has, has evolved in that in that sense of managers and coaches now, um, you know, getting to know you as a person rather than just a footballer. So I think he was ahead of his time a little bit in that sense. And um yeah, we you know we we ended up losing the playoff final that year uh, to Derby, so we, we were close to to going up to the Premier League. And I remember in the summer speaking to Tony, and again it was you know he'd he'd rotated the squad a lot and rotated the team, and I'd had interest from Preston at that time, and and they were going close to to pushing and, and getting to the Premier League at that stage. So um, I remember making the the move. Um, again, it wasn't kind of. You know, we left on bad terms or anything like that. It was kind of like, you know, I've foreseen going to Preston and playing 46 games, starting every game. And, um, yeah, in hindsight, if I look back on my career, as much as I don't have regrets, um, West Brom ended up going up that year and we missed out on the playoffs in Preston. So, yeah, if I was uh, to go back in time and potentially make my decision, I'd have stayed at West Brom and um, under Tony. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably one of my, you know, the only regret if I did have one of my career was was moving on at that stage. But yeah, I loved working for Tony. And then I actually went back when I was, uh, after my injury, um, when I tore my adductor, I'd been at Blues um, and I'd uh, obviously rehabbed at Blues and um, had a year kind of getting myself back fit. And Tony was at Coventry at the time. And I, I went in at Coventry for a couple of weeks just to train as well, because it was local uh, to help me sort of get back to fitness as well. Um so yeah, sort of Tony was great then. You know, I remember calling him just to say, you know, is there any chance I can come in and get a few sessions? And he was like, 100%, whatever you need, come in. Um, so yeah, I had a, a couple of weeks with him when he was at Coventry. And again, exactly the same, hadn't changed. Um, you could see, you know, what he was doing there as well at Cov. And um, yeah, like I say, I was absolutely delighted when I knew that he was, was coming into the club because I think he was the perfect man to come in at the perfect time really have you, uh, sorry go on alex yeah i was gonna say how have you had a chance to watch many of the uh the men's games over the last what six weeks or whatever that tony's been here i've seen bits and bobs and again that's probably the 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 only thing for me now is obviously we train on the saturday it's mm. our match day minus one and um even midweek games it's it's tough sometimes with our schedule but um but yeah i've seen um sort of bits and bobs and um just seeing, you know, I watched them trained a couple of times when they've been at Wast Hills using the mm. pitch there. Um, but again, knowing Tony and his philosophy and, and just him as a person as well, I knew that he was what, you know, he'd bring exactly what was, was needed for the group. And, you know, that positivity he wants players to express themselves. Um, yes, there's a structure and a way he wants you to play, but ultimately he wants, you know, especially like you, uh, you're more, I think he calls them like your Mavericks or, you know, those who are, are going to, you know, like a Bakuna or a, a Dembele, he wants them to flourish. But you also, he understands you need, you know, your, your Sonjic's, your, your Belix, your, you know, your others that are going to do the, the dirty work. So, um, yeah, balancing the team, I think, you know, you, I knew he'd, he'd come in and instantly do that and, and get people, you know, singing off the same hymn sheet, uh, sheet and, and obviously um, swimming in this, uh, the right direction. Yeah, I, I think uh, the one thing that's that's uh, impressed me so far has, has has just been he seems to know the he seems to know the answers to whatever little problem arises, doesn't he? And, and it, as you say, balancing balancing the the, the team into between, between artists and sort of worker bees, or you know, to butcher a metaphor there, certainly something that 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 he's shown. Um, I, I know, I know the results didn't go the the, the team's way, particularly at, at the weekend. Um, but what what are your thoughts about the about the outlook of, of of the final sort of dozen games, Darren? 
Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty positive. If I, you know, and and, and again, I think. You know, um, I know Tony said he didn't a couple of weeks ago that he doesn't feel like the team's in a, a relegation battle or, you know, we're going to get dragged in. I think obviously the results of the weekend have, have maybe um, painted a different picture in terms of how the table looks. But yeah, I, I look at the squad and I genuinely see so much talent. And like you say, it's just balancing that out to, you know, your artists and, you know, the ones who are going to, you know, work and graft. And um, I think we've got a good balance of both to be honest. And um, there's so much experience in there as well. It's, yeah, it's just about, you know, staying, um, you know, trusting it really, trusting in what they're doing. They'll get the results that they need. I have no doubt. Um, and then it will be about how that summer then of restructuring and, and putting together a squad to, to go and compete next year. Um, so, yeah, the table at the moment, I know looks a little bit, you know, with the, with the results and, and those below us getting the uh, wins at the weekend. Um, but yeah, I think there's, you know, the squad is strong enough and, and has the mentality as well not to, to get dragged into that and, and get the results to to firstly get safe, you know, obviously consolidate in the championship. And and then um, I'll be really excited to see what happens in the summer and, and how um, the squad gets shaped for next year. Yeah, I think that that's, that's great. Um, Darren and the women's team have got a game against Blackburn Rovers at home uh, in a few weeks' time, the 17th of March. If you can all get down and support them for that. There's also further home games against Lewes and Sheffield United to come in the final seven. A big game this weekend against Crystal Palace. Darren, we wish you the best of luck for that one. And uh, thanks very much for coming on the podcast and sharing your insights. Really appreciate it. No, thank you, guys. Thank thanks, you. everyone, for listening as well. And a big keep rolling from all of us.